This is Jim Sawyer for CapitalismandCrisis.org. As we rejoin Zombinomics version 1.3, the White House clock is just striking midnight as our protagonists greet one another amid gloom. Donald Trump is firing all West Wing economists, Smith and Robinson included. They must be out by daybreak or, at the behest of an agitated president, the zombies risk being turned into raving wonks on Fox News. Before fleeing, Professor Robinson assesses capitalism's limp vital signs. Even as she informs Professor Smith, her research notes come from cocktail napkins. She made it at a D.C. bar frequented by political flax. Are you tracking okay, Adam? She asks. Even if you disagree, please say something. Well, sure, chortled Smith, but first, what's this napkin note that says, for a good time, call 888, oh, just zip it, Robinson explodes. Following another profuse apology, Smith continues. For the most part, you've won, actually, Professor Robinson. I'm now tracking your explanations quite well. Perhaps so well, I may stop being your political adversary. Adam, retorts Robinson, if you abandon laissez-faire, Trump will think I'm responsible for your pivot. He may put us both in irons. We're still, he may have us shipped off to Breitbart. Oh, but it's not about you, Jones, says Smith. Rather, it's about context. Context. It's about understanding classical economic doctrine, any doctrine, not in isolation, but informed by actual human events. And because you didn't come on stage until two centuries after me, you've got loads more experience with economic events than I do. You're way better equipped to contextualize what's happening now. Contextualize? Explain. Examples? Examples? Robinson demands. Interrupting, however, a male White House porter approaches urgently with important information for the zombies. In between late-night Twitter posts and from bugs planted in flower pots, the president has been eavesdropping. He's now yelling about a zombie double-cross, cautions the porter to Adam Smith. You'd better savvy up. As for your female companion, she's the one he's actually holding accountable. Without blinking, the zombies rush to finish before daybreak heralds their demise. So back to context, Smith continues. Some examples? Sure. Even some from outside economics. I've been reading research by Dr. Stephen Berzhushka on smoking outcomes of American males compared to Japanese males. Turns out, Smith observes, the typical American male smokes half as much as his Japanese counterpart, but dies twice as often from smoking-related causes. Look at him, snarls Robinson. We're two economists about to meet our demise and your panning research by a Seattle physician about Japanese smokers? This had better be good. It is good. It is, emphasizes Smith. You see, death from smoking isn't just about smoking alone. It's about context in which smoking occurs. American males are much more vulnerable to tobacco because, compared to Japanese males, they live in a much less equal society, and that impacts their overall health remarkably. They aren't just vulnerable to smoke, but contextually to smoke compounded by the effects of United States class-based inequality, social isolation, and economic marginalization included. Okay, Robinson reflects, I'm beginning to understand why you find context so important. So let me get right to where I think you're headed. The significance for economics, apparently, is this. Doctrine-heavy claims about how the economic world is believed to work must be tempered by real-world context, by how doctrine actually performs, not how one merely wishes it to perform. Gotcha, Adam Smith responds. So let's see more examples, economic examples, Robinson prompts. Next, Smith delves into China. Their economic growth rates once tripled or quadrupled America's, he observes, but more recently, Chinese progress is sagging somewhat, and here's an important reason why. Early on three decades ago, China relocated massive numbers of workers from rural farms 
to urban factories. Growth soared. But once the really productive workers had been moved, turns out those at the back of the queue, productivity-wise, were not able to continue to make the same astonishing contributions. And so, asked Robinson? Well, simply put, says Smith, context changed in the shift from rural farms to urban factories. Chinese economic policies based on old, rapid growth, rural to urban, broke down somewhat as massive rural displacement ebbed. The current situation calls for policy freshening, based not just on how Chinese leadership thinks its society should work, but upon how China's economy actually is working now. Then Smith asks Robinson, do you see parallels with the United States? Wow, yes I do, Robinson responds. So, to throw some light on that, next we should explore why laissez-faire came to crisis during the Great Depression and why fundamentalists were unable to accept fully necessary paradigm revisions. Good idea. But you know, Joan, says Adam, I can't help fixating on what's about to happen to us. Do you suppose we'll be sucked out of the White House through the ventilating system? Will my powdered wig be blown away? I'm not sure I could find another just like it. Calm yourself, Adam, Robinson cautions. Remember, we're zombies now. So, one, probably I won't hurt much. And two, screw your stupid wig if you don't mind me speaking boldly. Just then, the air conditioning switches on with a powerful blast. Is this it? The zombies wonder. To be continued, stay tuned. <laughs>